case, it's the it's the availability, mm -hmm. right? So exactly. We've been, shopping, we've been shopping cars and have had to look at rentals. Our local Hertz has tripled their prices. Tripled. Wow. Your daily rentals. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And they blamed it on, they blamed it on, I don't know what, but it, it turns out that Hertz sold off an enormous part of their fleet in early 2020. Right. In anticipation of pandemic and can't restock. So. Yep, and, and the yep. supply chain is screwed up because of chip shortages, so you can't actually buy a lot of vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, EVs <clears throat> are starting to rocket up uh, because the dealers are slapping on five ten thousand dollar $10,000 profit to the sticker. Yeah, and plus, you want one, you pay. <clears throat> their business model is like they can't have too much inventory around, and if they don't have inventory and none of the other car rentals places have inventory and they're all renting for three times the price that they used to they're making the same amount of money so it works out okay for them this is the uh last ogm check-in call of 2021 it's thursday december 30th 2021 we are already well on our way into the death spiral of of oh my god the world is falling apart but we're going to pull up we're going to pull out we're going to fly straight narrow and point up uh, with a topic sort of like the one that got a, a, some resonance was, uh, what do we want? Uh, I got a refinement from Paul Crafell, who may make the call. <clears throat> and Paul said, what are the qualities we would like to increase within the world and why? And then I also got a note um, um, about cellotogenesis and uh, sort of going in, in that direction. Um, so we could sort of pick among those. And also we are open for recommendations, suggestions, ideas, riffs on those topics. I love the qualities one. I like, and you know, not just because I like Paul Carcel, but I, I like that topic a lot. And um, recently I had a bunch of people over to my house because they were complaining about the situation. I said, well, let's do something. And what we really all came to was a sense of unity and a sense of being together is the quality that we want to bring. This, and so we decided to do some weekly meditations um, you know, in the town square because to just emphasize what it is to be together, what all the things that bring us together in common. And I think that that's really what I wanna bring in 2022 is really these, the emphasis on all the things that we do have in common and how human beings can come together. I think that's, that's my number one uh, quality this year. I love that, Grace, thank you. Um, and also, uh, salutogenesis is very much like, what does well-being mean? And what are the things that would bring us into a state of well-being? So I think those things all tie together and they're a good, good conversational topic. I like I like the amendment, Grace, because it takes us from what would we like to increase in the world to also what would we like to increase in ourselves, what are the qualities of how we want to be. Thank you. And also, what should we do about it? Yeah. Yeah. Or my, what might we do about it? Trying to avoid the word "should." Mm -hmm. Might's a good word. <clears throat> Might is mighty. Mm hmm. I had, a, I had a former uh, colleague uh, when I was at Palo Alto who would, would typically in meetings uh, say to this room of, you know, sort of resigned bureaucrats, well, what might be possible here? Now, it's, it had, 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 had great solutionary power, you know, so, 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 so in, in the sense of dissolving blocks as well as opening solutions. Um, at IDEO, they, uh, they use the phrase, how might we so often that HMW at the beginning of any statement was taken to mean how might we do whatever. <clears throat> it's actually really, really handy. HMW, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, that, and then you're off and running with a potential uh, you know, possibility. Uh, it's good because the, the, the mind relaxes when it's not how could we or how should we or how will we. Yeah. Yeah, she might have stolen it from IDEO for all I know. Uh, these things all have mixed, yeah. mixed breeding. Yeah. It's funny. Um, Ken Homer uh, posted a long post on Facebook yesterday saying he's basically getting off Facebook and uh, uh, he's kind of, uh, he had, uh, he, it was, it was like a, a two page uh, sort of write up with lots of really good reasons and all that. And in the middle of it, he said, 
um, as Abraham Lincoln is quoted as saying, and then I'm forgetting the saying right now, but actually the, the saying is not attributed to, to Abe Lincoln, it's attributed entirely to someone else. And then of course I Googled it and that attribution has no proof whatsoever. So, so the fact check from Reuters <clears throat> on that was like, oops, nope, not even him. And it's like, well, okay. Um, but, but Ken was also looking for what to do, right? And his, his, I think a piece of his logic was by participating in Facebook, while it hasn't changed, while it hasn't apologized, while it hasn't done anything to improve itself, really, that we can tell, and before anybody's legislated any remedies that may or may not work, um, maybe we just get off. <clears throat> and maybe that's, a, that's a, an aid to well-being. Don't know. And, and Stacy, you've been, you've been having success connecting with people and people who aren't all you know, of the same mind and all that through Facebook. So I'm, I'm wondering what your reaction was to, to Ken's move and, and how you feel about that whole issue. Well, so first of all, it's, it's, I wanna just say it's very draining to do what I'm doing. You know, I'm feeling that now. I mean, it, it, it's hard. But I live in the might, you know, what might you do space, which is also hard. <laughs> um, I felt sad when I read it because so getting to Grace's point with the unity connection, without a doubt, is what I'd like to see more of in my life and in the world. That would be probably the most important word. So to read Ken, you know, going off, I immediately felt like a little bit of a loss. So uh, Stacey, um, Ken, we we're just talking about your post on Facebook oh. yesterday <laughs> and Ken just arrived. And, and Stacey, you just said connection without a doubt is the thing I'd want. And I actually started writing down connection without a doubt. Because, I, because, because on, on then reflecting on the sentence, I think you just meant the word connection, right? Uh, right, connection is what I want. And I'm like, hmm, connection without a doubt is a really, really interesting phrase. I like it. Um, uh, Paul, uh, welcome to the call. And at the top of the call, I put your question uh, into the chat as well, uh, which I'll retype into the into the chat. But you had emailed me this, which is which is nice. We're kind of starting in this in this general realm. So thank you for the refinement of of what do we want uh, over email last night. Uh, and and Ken, since we opened the Pandora's box of uh, Facebook's effects and all that, and we're, we're deliberately aiming up, not down here in this call, but um, what you thinking? How you feeling? Hello, everybody. Uh, what am I thinking, feeling? Well, it felt really good to, to write that thing out. I've been cooking on that for a long time. Um, for those who haven't seen it, I, I posted a long post on Facebook about why I'm, I'm taking a break, possibly, possibly leaving, I don't know. Um, I am really looking forward to not being on Facebook in many ways. Um, I have a huge stack of books that are sitting here. I have other things that I, I know I should be doing and Facebook's very seductive and takes my time away from that. So I'm looking forward to that. <clears throat> um, and I'm also just, highly disturbed by what goes on in Facebook and seeing how insidious it is that, um, you know, for me, leaving Facebook is like tearing off a piece of my heart because I have so many connections there. It feeds me in so many ways, but staying feels like it's tearing off a piece of my soul because I know that I am, I am part of this vast machinery that is doing horrible, horrible things in the world. And despite the fact that there's, um, all kinds of acknowledgement about how bad that is, thanks to Francis and, you know, the whistleblowing, the vast majority of people saying, well, yes, but I, this is how I stay in contact with my friends. And, you know, I have to do this for work and I have to do it for this and that. And it's like, if we were in Nazi Germany in 1933, would we be saying, well, yes, the Nazis are horrible, but they're in charge and we have to go, you know, I'm, I can't stand by it anymore. So um, I, I said in my post that two things would bring me back. One would be some soul searching and a mea culpa on Facebook's part to say, we have been doing terrible things. We are going to change that. And if that doesn't happen, then the government's stepping in and saying, okay, we're going to break up this monopoly and we're going to regulate you um, because I, I just can't in good conscience stand there anymore. And I'm very torn because I really do have a lot of people that um, I care about on Facebook and, and it is a great fun thing to do. But uh, on balance, I, I feel really good for having made the declaration and um, I'm really looking forward to catching up on some reading and maybe getting back to drawing on the right side of the brain. I haven't drawn in a long time, so I want to take that up. And you That's know, a great book. Um, so, so I feel 
good. I feel really grateful for this year. I know a lot of people are saying they can't wait to see the back of 2021, but um, for me, this last year has been phenomenal. Uh, thanks to Matt Saia, I, I got to work for six months doing these uh, inclusion uh, presentations, and I talked to almost a thousand people, and and that had a really profound effect on me of hearing different stories of, uh, you know, uh, very lovely African American men in Atlanta. Um, and this is a, the world's largest financial services firm. He's like, everybody got hoodies with the logo on it. And I cannot wear a hoodie because I am a big black man. And a big black man in a hoodie is a threat, even walking down the halls of this establishment where I feel relatively safe. So stuff like that, just I, I have these voices echoing in my head of things that people said that that really drove home the point of how poorly we treat each other. And to see a, a company like this one take on the issue of inclusivity head on and, and, and do it in a way where it's like, we're not trying to shame you. We're not trying to blame you. We're simply trying to make you more sensitive to the context in which we so often unconsciously make remarks and, and do things that make people feel they're not safe, they're not welcome, they're not valued. And it was very, very um, profoundly moving for me and, and gratifying to see people grapple with this and, and take it on. So I, I'm leaving 2021 with a, a, a sense of there's a lot of people working really hard to make the world a better place. And I don't see that reflected in the media, but I see it reflected in my life. So that's what I hold on to. That's what keeps me sane. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I'm thinking and feeling right now. All right, Grace, then Gil. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment about the Facebook thing, which I'm not, um, I'm not on Facebook, I stopped it in June, and I didn't miss it. So apparently I wasn't using it very much. So I'm not a good example. But it reminds me a little bit of when I gave up a car, I stopped using a car for the wastefulness and all the other things. And people said, Yeah, but you know, driving your kids around to because my kids had to use the buses and walk and go to their own, you know, whatever it is after school program. And people said, yeah, but what about the quality time that you spend with your kids in the car driving them places? And I just said, if that's your quality time with people, your children, then there's a different problem going on. And I feel a little bit that way about Facebook. Like in some ways it was making me feel connected, but I wasn't really connected. Um, so I just, I feel like when connection is really important, there are other ways to get it that are more fulfilling and more, I don't know, what I want more of this year. So, yeah. Love that. And some things, some things are hard. And one of the reasons Facebook is so attractive is that it's simple, it's easy, it's shiny, it, it connects us all. Um, I remember <laughs> seeing the links that Pete put in the chat about how might we, it's great. Um, it, I, you know, I remember long ago thinking, why does my, why do, I'm not that connected to any of my schools. So I don't really, participate very much in alumni associations, but I had this idea like, God, why doesn't one of these schools help connect all its alumni electronically? Really simple, just like create a platform and invite all the alumni in. And, you know, multiple years later, here comes Facebook having killed off a bunch of sort of competitors that didn't start in schools, started in other places. Um, so something, something interesting has happened in there. Um, Gil, please. Thanks, Jerry. Ken, I am so grateful for who you are as well as for what you wrote. Um, you know, I mean, you, 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 gave, you gave really thorough voice to what a lot of us are feeling and thinking, and it's a great frustration and challenge. Um, um, I keep on thinking about getting off Facebook and I check out some of the so-called alternative platforms and sorry to say nothing's as good, um, you know, as, as, as vile as they are in so many ways. Well, tell, tell me, Pete, when it's your turn. As vile as Facebook is in so many ways, the UX is relatively, yeah, is relatively simple and effective um, in a way that I haven't found anywhere else. So be that as it may. Um, I, I observe that when I think about going off Facebook, I go through some of the same thoughts, Ken, that you did of how will I stay in touch with people and where will I get the, you know, the, the perspective and connections and input and so forth. And I don't usually remember, but I do this morning that I actually had a life before Facebook existed where I felt connected, you know, and had had relationships with lots of people and they were rich and they were generative and they fed me um, without this. And so I, you know, there's this manufactured dependency that I've come to take for granted. 
Uh, and it's like, you know, you know, it's like what Grace was saying about the car. I certainly could live without it and I could have a rich life without it. It's a little harder to think about right now in pandemic time, because, you know, as I've talked about before, we're, you know, Jane and I take a pretty strict um, uh, isolation regime on this and I'm lonely. Uh, you know, and I miss people and I very much miss the tactile physical contact in the same place with pheromones and skin and so forth. Uh, and so this, you know, these little simulacra uh, fill in for that for me. Um, on the other hand, you know, what is it? It's 8.15. I've been, I've been at work for two hours today. I have not touched Facebook. Uh, I'm actually happier and more productive. Very likely why you got something done this morning. How about that? Yeah. That's it. Uh, Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Gil. Mr. Jones. You're muted, so there you yeah. go. Um, two things I think. One is I've, I've got an old iPad and I've got my Twitter and Facebook there and my new iPad, I do work on this email and everything other than social media. So I have to uh, get, but I, I have several things that, that aren't on my social media iPad. And that hack is, is good to limit my time. I, I'm just, you know, there's a, the way Quick Notes does bookmarks only works on the new iPad and other things like that. Uh, on connection, I, I'm doing a, a new project. I think it's pretty interesting. I've been doing this economic justice stuff, and I'm building a currency with a guy who's built a an eco village kind of thing here called uh, Highland Lake Cove. He's got 200 houses people are in, and he's got vacation rentals, and he does. Uh, does some conference space and seminar space and, and other kinds of things. And he's uh, wanting to translate. He owns everything and makes every decision. And um, he wants to transfer it, uh, ownership to the next generation of both family and employees. All his family kind of live there too. And, um, and so I'm helping him design the currency that he's going to see it with a one lot of a vacation rental, so sixty thousand for one the first year. But we're going to link the currency we're doing with our repair fund in this uh, community that was uh, moved uh, for the Biltmore to be built, the Shiloh community. So we're going to do the design together and see how we can link those two currency flows in this, you know, secluded, not gated, but secluded, uh, eco villagey kind of place. And you know, a lot of consciousness stuff and all that kind of thing goes on there. That, that you know, new agey consciousness, you know, wonderful stuff, whatever. And and then uh, you know, a a, a marginalized uh, neighborhood that that people you know don't think about. And you know, they're like a lot of groups. They think in the in the eco village Highland Lake, they think about climate change and never think about you know the folks they don't see in these uh, communities that got displaced. And so anyway, I, th I think the. Designing the currency together uh, will help me figure out a lot of things. Uh, you know, what messages work is one thing uh, for both sides and, and how they build trust and stuff. So we're going to, anyway, we're going to, and he's going to be, you know, uh, he's agreed to seed the, some of the first of the repair fund with, with some part of the currency. And when we're also going to do a Gaia repair, he's, we're figuring out where that goes. So we're doing kind of a, a social repair and a guy repair as parts of the currency. So I think it should be pretty interesting. We, we're going to be probably working with somebody who's worked with Art Brock on the currency, you know, Fer, Fernanda Abara. He's pretty cool. So, Fernanda's great. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot of that kind of work around reputation currency and currency that is non monetary and specifically yeah. eco villages. So please reach out. Oh, great. I, uh, if, if you can. I, I'm, if you could email, that'd be great. I will connect the uh, two of you over email right now. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, I don't Thank know you. anything about it, but he, he's got money and wants to do it. And, and I, he, he asked me to help him design it. Yeah, I also did some work with art, so I, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Great. Thank you, Grace. Email sent. Um, uh, Ken, if you were to anonymize the stories you heard through the, the meetings you conducted, um, is there a, a small book or a long essay in there about some of those insights? Yes. Okay, good. 
Um, it would not be a small book. It would, it would just be, a, it wouldn't even be a long essay. It just might be a few pages of, you know, some quotes and context and quotes. Um, it might actually turn into a couple of sort of incidents or episodes or uh, vignettes <clears throat> that are, that thread together in some interesting ways or whatever else. I don't know. Yeah, I'll share the thing that touched me the most out of all of the interviews of 89 cohorts that I took through was uh, we asked people at the end to make some kind of commitment as a result of being present on the call. And I always said, you know, go for something really modest, do something you can find that's very easy, you can do every day that won't exhaust you that because you're in the investment business, just like an investment, if you make a regular deposit, you're gonna have a big return at the end. And uh, a lovely woman who was probably she's been with the company over 25 years, um, I'd say late 50s or so, African-American said, I am not going to make a commitment. Um, but based on this call and the people on this call has been set on this call, I'm going to recommit to believing that this company is serious about inclusion because I've been here a long time. I've seen a lot of things come and go and not make any difference, but this feels really different. And I'm going to recommit to believing that the company is serious. And I got goosebumps. I was like, wow, that just made me feel like I did something. You know, I was part of something very useful here today. I, I changed someone's mind to reorient them back to their work of saying, you know, there's, there's a way in which I'm going to give the company the benefit of the doubt, um, as opposed to being um, cynical from having seen all these things, you know, arise and fail. And that, that, think was the the one thing on the the calls that just stuck with me the most of um made, made me feel like i did something good you know love that ken thank you uh go ahead john thank you um so just hearing the last couple of comments especially grace and kevin reminded me i'm i'm anxious to hear what pete's uh facebook alternatives are because he's i have an idea that good question yeah. <laughs> they're thoughtful, but I was struck by the fact that, hey, this group is building the, the Lego blocks of the Facebook alternative. And, you know, it's like, you got to go a step up. And, and, and Kevin, you know, you, you, you said it right away. You know, you, people think about ecology, but they don't think about the places that are replaced. So, you know, you're, you're both identifying where there is a great connection and where there's something missing. And that process of putting those things together, that's a Facebook alternative. Um, so there's, there's things that are needed besides the connection, you know, the, in the simplistic sense that the Facebook says, I mean, one other simple thing that's needed that I guess is still problematic. Pete can uh, update us on this. And this might be regulation that, that a regulation that says, okay, this little piece of software that goes in and grabs everything about you from, Facebook and injects you into it's one of these chosen successors. Facebook can't block that. That's that's fine. You go <laughs> ahead and do that. And I think that would that would go a long way because then uh, folks like Ken, uh, you know, any of us, I I am only getting it using it for family pictures that people insist on only putting on Facebook. <laughs> so I have to have, I have to be there to see the pictures, but I don't, I don't pursue the connections. I don't want the connections to be on Facebook because I don't want them to stay there. I, mean, I know we're going to something better than Facebook and I'm just impatient to get it there. Um, but, you know, if we keep going here, if we keep putting the pieces together and if we get that little Facebook inject ejector ejection seat, then to our friends, we can say, you know, I'm leaving. Oh, by the way, here's the Facebook ejection seat. <laughs> I'm sending you two or three, take your pick, you know, come on over to, uh, to something else and uh, we'll, we'll have a better future. Uh, Pete, I believe the floor may be yours just for a swing, just a swing. <laughs> That'll teach me to speak up. <laughs> um, uh, first, I would say I, I'm not too interested in talking about Facebook because Facebook is really boring. Um, just leave. It's not that hard. Um, uh, I'm on Facebook right now. I don't I, I log in every month or so. And uh, the only reason I haven't left is because our HOA is is unofficially on it. So that's where I get the news about my local local community. Um, uh, my my down fingers were, I, I think, in response to Gil saying um, it's it's the best thing there's there's nothing better um and 
and it's it's kind of like Grace's car thing, you know. Um, a car is really great, um, but you kind of have to balance it. You know, is is a car better than walking? Is being in, in a car for a long time with your kids driving in places a better way to be with your kids? You know, it, it, it Facebook seems easy um, and it seems inclusive and generative and all of that's like a, a, an artifice. Um, it's, it's a place where you go to have, like, like Ken said, your, your soul sucked, you know. Um, so I, um, uh, for me, uh, Facebook is, I, being distant from it and logging in once in a while, it's really interesting to kind of observe myself getting sucked into the, the endorphin trap, you know. Um, uh, you know, it's like after 10 minutes, I'm clicking and scrolling and clicking and scrolling and go, okay, that's the Facebook thing. That's the Facebook suck. I don't like that very much. Um, and then I, I log off um and clear my cookies uh for me where i like to hang out is twitter um uh, twitter has got that same kind of endlessly mindlessly scrolling thing that that facebook does but it doesn't have the suck um uh, i find a lot of generative stuff about twitter and and it's not trying to suck me in and, and uh, take over my life so it's really easy to go i need some i need some uh i need some entropy in my life and I go read Twitter for a while and I found lots of good stuff. Um, Twitter, I think is it's it's not as easy to set up a feed. Um, you have to you have to kind of it's not hard, um, but you have to kind of purposely follow the people that you find interesting, uh, search for things that you find interesting and follow the people there. Um, and then you have to uh, another thing that you have to do that I watched my wife struggling with a little uh, I don't is to unfollow people when they post stuff that you don't want to see. Um, so you just kind of winnow your your net until it's uh, until it sings for you Twitter sings for me. Um, uh, there's a bunch of stuff happening in discord um, discord is a wonderful and amazing place there's a bunch of interesting stuff happening in matrix. Um, uh, I am continually, I'm, I'm a little bit of an edge case uh, for this one, but I'm continually blown away by the FedWiki uh, community. Um, Ward and, and the crew there are doing amazing things. Um, uh, and Matrix is uh, a little bit hard to get into um, still. It's getting a lot better. Um, but but then the rewards are so high that, you know, and it, and it feels good. It feels like eating nutritious food. Um, rather than Facebook feels like eating junk food. Um, so find, you know, find places where interesting people are hanging out and go there. Uh, and the lesson for me, the thing that Facebook is still better at than anything for me is that there's all my people there, you know, all my weird relatives, um, people I've never, you know, all the, all the people from a couple different schools uh, I've, I've been to and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, it's an interesting thing, but I don't really use it very much, and I don't think it's worth. Um, I don't think it's worth the soul suck to to have that access to everything. The other thing Facebook is really good at is scale. You know, it has billions of people on it, and you have to ask yourself: Is is this a good thing for the world? Do we want a monoculture thing where, uh, like billions, literally billions of people are are logged into this thing, having their algorithms, you know, program people's brains? It's not good. Um, that kind of centralization and, and and scale is just we we have found out that that kind of scale is really toxic um, and does bad things to humanity. It maybe does good things to yourself, but it does bad things to your humanity. Um, I'm reminded a little bit. Uh, Corey Doctorow has got an interesting thread on Twitter, and I'll put a link in the chat um, today. And I've I've been trying to figure out how not to post it because um, because I have another guilty pleasure. Um, I have a bunch of uh, Alexas in my house, um, and we talk to Alexa, and she talks to us. Um, uh, Corey's got a thing where he's he's like, dude, don't even play with the Alexa things because uh, they're soul sucking surveillance machines. And I don't feel that way. <laughs> uh -huh. um, uh, the surveillance that that Alexa and Amazon are doing is different than the surveillance that Facebook is doing, I think. Um, and, and it's not, it doesn't feel 
toxic to me. Um, Google is doing all this, an amazing amount of surveillance too. Um, uh, so I've, I've been avoiding trying to, I've been trying to figure out how I can post just a little bit of this thread. Um, but anyway, I'll post the thread. He says something interesting in it, and it's a little bit hard to unwind. It's a little bit, you have to kind of read it. Uh, it's not a perfectly written uh, Corey thing. It's, it's um, still very smart and um, thoughtful, um, but you have to read it a little bit to understand what he's saying. But basically what he says is, uh, there are a bunch of things in our lives, and for him, uh, Alexa is one of them. Facebook is another. He doesn't mention Facebook. Uh, he mentions he does mention privacy in connection to Alexa, um, and then uh, things like environment and stuff like that. There are things that seem easy. Um, it's it's easy to smoke a cigarette for yourself, and you get pleasure out of it, but you don't. That every cigarette doesn't add up to cancer for you. It's only after decades that it adds up to cancer. Um, same thing with uh, uh, the environment or privacy or things like that. There's things that that seem easy and small and and not harmful in the moment, but add up over time to um, big fails. Uh, he he calls them. So Facebook is another one of those things where. Um, it's it's a, an easy candy bite um, and it's you know long term extremely toxic especially to uh, collective humanity so uh, Ken yeah maybe someone here knows better than than I I seem to have it in my head from reading something that basically people in India Facebook is their internet. It's really insidious. It's it's ins, it's insinuated itself into Indian um, society. Like most people with internet access in India only use Facebook, and I think that might be the case for some countries in Africa too. So there's a very, if that is true, that's a billion people that are basically controlled by Facebook. You know, their their media access, their internet access, controlled by Facebook. So it just it's one it's one of those things that makes me very wary of Facebook. What I had heard, um, and this happened during the Facebook um, fail, basically when they when the Facebook went down for a while, uh, was that India was extremely dependent on WhatsApp for communications, and that the, at that because Facebook went went down, so did WhatsApp, and so did Insta, and the WhatsApp wipeout had had just like really crippled communications across India because so many people were dependent on it. Um, it's it's likely that there's a lot of penetration also for uh, for Facebook, but I I, I don't know. Well, who owns who owns WhatsApp? That's right. That's why but, they all went. That's why they all, all went down. That's where Ken's option of the regulatory solution comes in. If Facebook got you know got carved up, would it be less vile? Uh, there's a whole conversation to be had about what's a good remedy to this, and well, should Facebook be regulated and or broken up or this or that. Um, let's let's try to avoid that here because it's it's lengthy and and interesting, but not I think uh, I think it'll take us down one of those rabbit holes that we don't necessarily want, uh, and it would be actually, I think, an interesting topic for a future call. <clears throat> um, and Pete, if you can find Corey's tweet, I think, uh, and post it, that would, that would be great. Corey does, I, I don't fully understand how Corey's brain functions, much as I am in awe of how Pete's brain functions. Um, and like Corey posts these, these insanely deep things uh, often in all different kinds of media. And then just randomly on Twitter, he'll post, <laughs> 15 images that are basically vintage photo albums or sci-fi book covers from whenever. And then a couple of weird images that are sort of like, why did he post that in the middle of nothing? It's like, it's like I don't know how he traffics in so much information and still maintains sanity of some sort. It's kind of cool. Um, Paul Caffell, I wanted to invite you, now that you've finished breakfast, uh, I wanted to invite you back into the conversation uh, just to maybe riff on the question you had posed, which is, what are the, what are the qualities we would like to increase within the world, and why? Uh, if you're if you're not in the kitchen cleaning up the bowl of whatever it was you were just eating, oh shoot! There's Paul. Good morning. Um, I have my video turned off because uh, our internet connection is this. Uh, it's AT and T. We're off, and the boonies has this black wire laying on the ground for about. A, couple hundred yards before it gets to our house. So it's it's spotty and I've been getting kicked off and on and off and on. We hear you clearly though, um, that's great. And sometimes the audio doesn't come in very good. And also 
I've just never been on Facebook. So that whole topic, I have no idea exactly what the beast is like. But um, in terms of <clears throat> quality that uh, I'd like, I was thinking, I, I would like, uh, I would like humanity to realize that there is a positive place for us within the world. Take that. You broke up after positive place for us in the world, Paul. Shoot. See, this just proves that the inner tubes are conspiring to shut no, down. It's AT and T. Is that it, uh, Paul? We have lost you now. I have to stop talking. Oh, there we go. Uh, come back. Uh, you are back with us. Was there a break in what I was saying? Yes, right after uh, your first lovely statement. Positive place for us in the world. Yes. Ah, okay. I will try again here. Um, I, I would like us to, I think there's something in our culture that kind of thinks that uh, humanity is sort of, uh, we don't, we don't recognize what a wonderful opportunity we've been given, not as people, but as life. And that uh, there's a wonderful opportunity for service and for helping shape the world, <clears throat> that all living things have the power to shape the world for us to say we can shape the world is not godlike, it's earthworm-like and salmon-like. and. Uh, there's just this wonderful millions of years uh, invitation to us. Um, and we just haven't, we just haven't got it. We, we kind of, I think part of the problem we're looking at is we tend to see the world in terms of zero sum games of winners and losers and uh, instead of collaborative. And so that's my dream for the quality I want more of. Um. I love that, Paul, and I love what you just said. Um, and the thing that attracted me to your thinking really early when uh, Art Brock uh, sent me a video, the video that you'd made, was that with a hand trowel and some principles, you were walking around healing hillsides and you know re reclaiming a piece of land near where you live and making and sort of making things better. Um, I've got uh, I've got a website at Upkido. Uh, uh, keto.com because my my sport is aikido and upward spiral uh, inspired by you and uplift inspired by david Brin and others sort of in different ways the idea of what does a practice look like where everything is improved through when we when we come in contact with it to just have a, a, a mindfulness or an approach to do something like that so <clears throat> I, I i love that it's earthworm like that's a that's a really nice uh rescaling of um, I think that the situation a lot of humans are in on earth, which is they feel like the problems are too big. They're facing hyper problems. Uh, governments aren't fixing or working very often. They're often too corrupt. And so what, what on earth is my action going to do? And, and I like this analogy very much to, uh, you know, the, when the whale dies, a whale fall uh, is, is a huge nu nutrient event uh, for the ocean, right? And that it didn't do anything actually to cause that except uh, run out of life. Yeah, the uh, well, the, I, I'm a big, big, big uh, fan of the second law of thermodynamics. I, I view it as really sort of a fundamental starting place for my thinking. And I, I kind of, one of the big things I draw from the second law is, um, I, I think our culture has it wrong that things have to run down. They don't, with the second law, as long as we have solar input, things can run up but it requires work and it's not the it's not the easy direction when people say go with the flow i kind of go no swim up against the flow and that it's um that there's this existential nobility about doing the work and i think our our whole sense of work in our culture tends to be associated with pay and that's kind of seen as something if you're smart enough to be able to get out of it, great. But I, th I think there's a, a really spiritually deep foundation to humbly accepting my job is to work. Um, we all have work to do. 
and help each other in our work and and try to use feedback to direct our work into even more productive ways that's like um one of the things i wonder is why did we separate work play and learning uh from each other we we separate those in our ages of life and in our days and and in a in a healthy community it seems like work play and learning are all like one you you you're going and you're doing something that's going to feed the village and you're having a great time doing it because you're with people you love and who take care of you and you're doing something that everybody who's junior is learning something about how to make it better and so forth and then we've kind of We've, we've taken scissors to the whole thing and we've sliced and analyzed and dissected and made everything efficient. And in making everything efficient, we've made it horrible. I, I was watching a video about how bananas get to us from a plantation. And there, there's a job where women stand, mostly women stand in front of an assembly line that has bananas going by and they peel bananas. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is their job. And, and I, I, I've, done, I've done labor, I've done some, a, a bit of labor in my life where I came home and I was like, wow, I did the same goddamn thing for an entire day. And that was like mind numbing. And in some cases painful because you repeat the same, you repeat the same gesture for a day. And it's very different from doing the gesture once or twice, really, really different. Uh, even if it's just peeling bananas. And um, we have so many people doing so many tasks just, just mm -hmm. for the wage. Uh, just so they can put food on their families, to to quote the wonderful W. Um, so Kevin, you wanted to jump in. The, the solar, the input of solar and the second law of thermodynamics, one thing of both currencies that we're doing is both are like Sarafu, which is I think the ideal currency in Kenya of grassroots economics, where there's regular inflows of capital into the, the alternative currency system. So that's just it relates to second law of thermodynamics. Um, thanks, Kevin. I'm just post pasting Serafu credit in the in the chat. The reason, <clears throat> that, the reason that planet Earth, Earth works <clears throat> is the difference between local and global entropy. Uh, here, think you know if, if if we're a closed system to matter, which we are, there's going to be entropy. But there's energy, if there's energy coming in from outside the system where it's yep. energy outside our system, then in fact, we are subsidized, Earth is subsidized by the sun. You can't have a sustainable closed system. It needs influx, whether it's solar energy or in Kevin's case, capital from the outside. Kevin, what's Highland clearances? So that's when they cleared the, you know, the barbarians of the Scots because they were, they discovered with the, the spinning jenny that they could commodify wool. And so they cleared folks off. And so they commodified land and they made people extraneous. And then they had to, you know, then go into uh, um, working for the manufacturing of the wool rather than, uh, you know, uh, cottage industries and stuff. So Highland clearances is, is one of the first massive uh, um, commodifications of land and, and uh, private property that then also commodified people. Got it. So like the enclosure acts, but different. It was a... Uh... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, and then you had to clear people off and then, and then you, you claimed ownership of a clan's territory because they weren't in your registry system as you... owning. And, and also... And then they... People used to live on the land like raindrops, and you would, you know, you'd be born in this hut, and then you would grow up and marry, and you'd like make a hut nearby, and so forth. And it was pretty organic on the land, and you like had food on the land. You could feed yourself from things that you planted nearby. Yeah. And then as the enclosure movements happened, because things like sheep, like hey, this land is much better used if we graze sheep on it. So we moved everybody off to road streets and villages, and we we organized and and sort of corralled people uh, to live in other places and push them off the land that they used to subsist on. And then often, right. we, often we got rid of the plots where they could actually grow some local food. So now they needed money to actually eat, right? And that, that, right. that, that, that made everybody a laborer instead of just a citizen who was able to, to self-subsist without necessarily a lot of money. Um, if you go up to on the west coast of Scotland, uh, you should try to visit Auchendrain. It's a uh, preserved uh, cooperative village. There were more than a thousand cooperative villages before the, the cash economy. And 
you know, they would do things like share the bull and they would also share the arable land in, in years in exchange. But then when some people started making money, the cooperative villages all fell apart. And this was preserved by somebody who became a, a wool baron, but wanted to preserve what he had grown up in. So it's, it's a really good, good, good afternoon to go to auction drain. Um, so one of the things that we're living in right now is a whole series of enclosure movements. Um, yeah. And I think one of the things we're trying to figure out is how to free ourselves of the enclosures and, and open source software is one way to open source and it's many derivatives, whether it's free software or CC zero or whatever we want to call it, but, but sharing information freely, uh, open data, all those kinds of things is one way to avoid the enclosure capture and reselling of our lives and information and habits and preferences. Uh, it's, it isn't just about sort of data, it's, it's sort of habits and preferences and all of that. Um, so what might, what, what else might we do? And then how much, how much does that have to do with our well-being? Uh, Shimon, you're, you're looking for solid, salutogenesis, which is a topic we should bring in and focus on more. Um, but how much does other people messing with our data affect our well-being? And, and, and maybe that's too narrow a question for you, but I'd love to see if we can start there. Well, first of all, sorry, I'm not on video. We're having our house uh, totally redone. So I'm in a car right now. Uh, I think that essentially what we're all about is trying to make sense of the world. And if we have too much attention through whether it's media or any other kind of instrument that tries to kind of manufacture our thoughts, it's not necessarily gonna be good for our well-being. The danger is, is that sometimes in an effort to make sense of the world, there's people who just captures pe you know, people's attention and meaning, and that causes a lot more danger. So in terms of uh, media, I think we're certainly escalating the amount and the level of you know, inputs into our brain and our brain, I don't think, is normally capable of handling that much information. So I think it's certainly not helping well-being. And especially when you're talking about people whose brain is being formed, like adolescents trying to figure themselves out and things of that kind, trying to get a sense of themselves. So I actually have been listening, talking about social media. I've been actually spending... A, some time on Clubhouse. And there's actually some very, very interesting dis discussion. There's one group that's actually dealing with Web3, which is more about the metaverse. And what intrigues me is what that's going to look like in terms of well being, where you can create an avatar of yourself. And what they're talking about is that particular avatar can be essentially in every one of the social media platforms that you interact with. And these are people who work for Intel, people who work for Google, who are not very happy with a lot of the things that people before talked about. So they're thinking about how through avatars and Web3, we can get past Facebook. I think it's intriguing conversations, but that in itself causes a lot of different problems. So Jerry, when you talked about how people identified with you know, self-production and things of that kind, part of it was belonging to something physical, whether it's your religious group, family. What we're facing now is people are really losing a lot of the connection, identity connection, and that's extremely dangerous on a personal level and political level. It's interesting. One of the things that Facebook does is it makes sort of super conductive the motion of people between different groupings or groups uh, because it's all just through the interface you can go find a group and join a group or whatever which means being sucked into some kind of conspiracy group is easy but it also means finding your way to your tribe ought to be easier and i think some of that is happening i think some people are finding their way into associations that are highly productive that are really interesting that are that are and, and they're using facebook to organize 
uh, Extinction Rebellion meetings or what have you, uh, you know, different kinds of, uh, of meetings. Um, but I think a big piece of well-being is belonging and feeling like you're part of a group that you have at your heart and that has you in their heart and they have that have one another's mutual interests at heart whatever that may mean because our interests are different they're not all the same right um so anyway uh, and i wanted uh, grace i was going to pass the mic to you also because i wanted to ask you to maybe explain to merge currencies and talk a little bit about that and then whatever else you wanted to jump in with as well where are we going text okay so yeah so one of the things that Will did very early with grassroots economics was that he did a whole bunch of simulations about the concentration of camp capital. And it was really obvious, and you can find there are very old YouTube videos with Will Ruddock from grassroots economics, but you can see that he's actually running these simulations. And it's quite shocking that just by eliminating um, any interest bearing, not even giving demurrage, like which is negative interest, but just eliminating interest bearing, the, 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 the capital doesn't end up concentrating with the people who earn the most. Because as soon as you're like a little bit of a better business person and you put it into an account and then that savings account accrues money, then you can invest more in your business and the concentration of capital accelerates tremendously just because of interest bearing money. And we're seeing, you know, we're at the tail end of that, but just by eliminating that in his first experiments, already he was able to create a much more thriving economy. And now, when, and, and it's not just about thriving economy because you really shouldn't be saving your money in Sarafu because it's a, like, it's not, you know, it's not real or whatever. It's not a banked currency necessarily. So they want to discourage people from saving it. And they want to encourage more and more velocity of the money in the markets. So he's implemented in a number of communities this thing where it's a small amount, but there's a little tax. If you're over a certain amount of balance at the end of the month, you pay a small tax on that so that you don't go over that amount. So that if you've got the Serafu and you're using it all the time. And so it, because it really is about, you know, buying a local food and it's really about encouraging this this local economy and not creating a concentration of capital and it's if you see the simulations it's really shocking how quickly it makes a difference the, the not concentrating capitalist thing is really really interesting and if you scroll back to the days of grains and all that i mean there's loss with grain grain is grain is interesting because you can tax it you can store it but then critters get into it some of it goes moldy uh, silo catches fire whatever there's sort of wastage there's there's general uh loss of grain. So you kind of need to keep it in motion or it spoils. And the idea that a currency might be sort of like that is pretty interesting. <clears throat> and yet we've invented the opposite, where when you bank yeah. currency and take it out of commission, it earns interest. And then that, you know, it's making more money and makes more money. And I really thought that that was against like the Bible. Call me crazy. Uh, and if you go look over the fence at Islamic finance, they, they go through a lot of gyrations to make sure they can still fund somebody buying a house, but they're not charging interest. They're participating in the appreciation or the value of the thing that's built. I mean, Islamic finance has really, really interesting ways of looking at this very, very, very notion of interest. Um, yeah. I think there's, there's, a, there's a ton there. And it's really interesting that Sarafu comes out of that organization. So, so Kevin, Grace, and whoever else is interested, I'm, I'm, I would love to see if we can sort of figure out more about that and how it fits what we're thinking about here, but then what else we might do to be helpful? And is there a way to adopt a community currency here? Because we are we have plenty of side conversations here. Um, not everybody's sort of involved, but, but in different calls that we have during the week, we're talking about, should we have a DAO here? And is there a cryptocurrency that would be useful to you know, OGM and its, and its allied communities? Is there something else? Should we play with NFTs and launch NFTs? I don't know, um, but, but those things seem more fanciful and I wanna say dangerous, I don't know, than the, these kinds of things, which are, which are attempts to bring money into circulation. And I love Arthur Brock said years ago, the word currency is like current C. It helps you see how value is flowing through a system. So it's useful in that way. Well, the pro so yeah, you I, I could go down that rabbit hole all day and I start my six week workshop with Arthur's um, with Arthur's lecture about value, right? And about Bessie the cow. Bessie the and cow, yay. Bessie the cow, yeah. And, uh, and, um, 
and if I had, I've had him as a guest a couple of times as well. But the thing is that this, we have to stop being so deluded that money is a store of value. It's not. Mm -hmm. Like if mm -hmm. you just think of the things you value, you can't buy them like air. I really, I'm such a big fan and money devalues air relationships, money devalues relationships. And so this is really not a good way of looking at value. And I've been developing an economy with the eco villagers that much more looks at values and reputation on, a, on different, at different um, aspects of reputation and the way in which that we interact with one another always has a reputational change, right? Like, oh, do I talk too much right now? Or, you know, like, right, there's, and am I saying something intelligent or not? And every moment that I continue to speak, there's an interaction in which 12 participants are developing a reputation about me. And it's, and it's interesting. So you can start at zero and be like, I'm just gonna invite you over for a cup of coffee and start to develop a reputation from zero. And it can't be transferable, but if you're nice, I'll let you stay for dinner too. And so you got something of value. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, like that, that whole thread is, is, you know, like I said, I've got a six week workshop on it and I've been doing a couple years of research on it and would really be very interested in that conversation of what can we do with these in these communities? Because what's hap what has happened is that it, it, we have a monoculture of communication methodology about value, but it's almost about everything. And that monoculture has created a certain way, a certain limitation in the way that we can relate to one another and the way governments relate to one another and all that stuff. And, and so creating a new form of communication is fundamental to creating a better world. And I'd really like to see a lot more, you know, for what would I'd like to see is really a lot more recognition of the value that we have to each other that really is, has nothing to do with bits and bytes on a you know computer um yeah which wasn't what i had wanted to talk about but you just took me down my favorite rabbit hole um um you know i was talking about that you were talking about the sense of belonging which again this is a really important value and you can see that the way that we deal with belonging or deal with contribution are very different um, and you know being a member of a group for example and i remember i was a member of a synagogue well, I don't know if I was a member because every year the rabbi would ask for a donation and he kind of knew who to ask for what, but you never felt like you were really a member because like, you're like, I guess this is the right amount, you know? And, and, and at some point, all of the, all the participants demanded a membership. They demanded it because we want to know we belong. Wow. Um, yeah, because they're like, look, we can have it tiered like, you know, for single parents and for whatever, but you have to give us a price list because otherwise we don't know we belong. For a religion. There, there, you want, to you the a, synagogue. You needed a and price it, list from the synagogue. That's fascinating well, to me. Well, it was interesting because you also, some of it was political, but it really, I've been to synagogues that I've gone to where you walked in and you felt like you belonged. Like the second you walked in. In this place, there was some stuff going on. Like, I don't want to go into it. But, you yeah. know, there was this sense of like, I want to know I'm a member. And, you know, you could say a number of hours or whatever, but you, I want to know what the criteria are for being a member. And I think in Facebook, there is this, you're talking about like a, people want a sense of belonging, like there isn't a criteria for belonging to a group. And one of the really scary things that I've heard, um, I heard with all these leaks was there was like, I can't remember what the number was, but it was something like 70% of the, the like, um, these, uh, these evangelistic Christian groups were completely created by bots mm -hmm. and populated by bots. And you could say, well, is that good or bad in some ways? You'd be like, well, if there's total misfits, they should be able to find a bot-based group where they feel a sense of belonging and love. And that's a good thing, right? As long as there isn't something under, you know, insidious about that. Right. And I, you know, I had a friend talk about, well, well what if we had that for pedophiles, like something that's completely simulated and at least they're over there. Right. And it's like, Maybe that's good, right? <laughs> you know? So I, there I, is this, like, like that's is that a sense moral of belonging? Dilemmas, right? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Grace. Uh, Gil, mid mid bite. Sorry about that. Okay, I wanted to respond to something, Jerry. You said about you know eight eight minutes ago, and I've gotten off on what Grace was saying. So let me just quickly try to touch on belonging and the Bible. 
um, Grace, I've been to synagogues where I've gone for years and no one ever comes up and talks to me. And I've been to synagogues where I walk in the door and someone comes and greets me, offers me a seat, invites me to do an aliyah, participate in the ritual of that morning, invites me home for lunch, total stranger. So very different cultures in different places. Um, the belonging thing is really important. Um, and um, to us as humans, and I've been thinking a lot ecologically about the challenge now is how do we, you know, I, I've been, some of you don't know, but I've been advising companies for decades on how to be more better stewards of the planet, et cetera. And I'm realizing that the game is not about how do we take better care of nature, it's how do we live as though we belong to the living world. Not just a belonging with, but a belonging as a part of. Um, um, and it's, it produces a very different conversation when we think about it that way. Um, belonging and bot longing, as Jerry calls it, um, though is a double-edged sword. Belonging is what draws people to QAnon. It's what feeds the Trumper community. It's just, you know, at, at a certain level, it's not so much ideological or thinking stuff through. It's like, it's feeling like belonging to something that matters. And it feeds Absolutely. people in a very powerful way and can't be fought. Um, without addressing that or, or re refeeding that in some kind of way. So enough on that. Um, on money, Grace, uh, I, I, I love what you've said. And I would, Jerry, I would, I would really value if we could do a call sometime in the future that's just looking at money and value and exchange this whole, you know, this whole ball of wax that Grace was just stirring, that Kevin was stirring earlier on. I um, love, love to see that. Easy thing to do before you proceed is to make that the topic of this check-in call in two weeks, given our rhythm of check-ins and topics. Uh, a different thing to do is to set up a separate call, which I'm happy to do. And the year, the new year is starting and it would be a good topic to, to break into the new year. So happy to do either or both. Let's start with the first, if Grace is up for it in two weeks and then see where it goes from there if we want to do more. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, um, Jerry, you, you, on your reflection about the Bible and interest, the Bible is very clear. You know, it doesn't like interest. It doesn't like accumulation. The whole money lender thing it, seems like a does, big deal in the Bible. It doesn't, it doesn't like kings. Uh, and the enterprise kind of went off the rails because it's, it's very clear. And it's not just the Bible. I mean, the whole debt thing is, you know, is, a re, is a reflection of Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian practice that had gone on for a couple of eons before that, according to Michael Hudson, of regular clearance of debt so there cannot be the accumulation and the growth of the creditor class. Jubilees. Jubilees. Um, we are now in Judaism in the Shemitah year where land holdings are reverted. Uh, debts are forgiven. Land holdings, are, actually, land holdings are every 50 years. Debts are reverted every, every, every seven. Uh, slavery is a limited term um, practice. They weren't able to eliminate it, but they were able to put lids on it. And this whole thing broke down and it broke down under the Roman occupation when the Jews were colonized people. And a lot of accommodation happened into the practices and traditions to reflect the needs of empire. Sounds familiar, right? We see that story playing out again and again here. Um, so, and, and actually the word for interest uh, in the Torah is, is neshek, which means bite. It's like something that takes a bite out of your side. Uh, and it's, it's very frowned upon. Uh, the Islamic banking has managed to more successfully maintain that tradition uh, than the Jewish tradition has, although the Islamics find ways to work around it uh, in a modern capitalist world too. But it's, I'd, uh, Grace, I'd love to see that simulation because I haven't seen anybody really uh, unpack what that would look like and what its dynamics would be and how it would work. So thank you for that. That's it. Okay. Can I chime in on that? Please, Shimon, go ahead. Yeah, part of the issue of belonging is very central to a lot of what we're talking about. That might be another interesting conversation. What I'm working on in terms of salutogenesis is trying to work back to first principles. I'm a big fan of uh, Elon Musk and a few of the other physicist engineers who always go back to first principles. And first principles for us as human beings is one, we develop a prediction machine, which is the brain. And then one important part of it is having to belong because that in a very major way, you know, magnifies our chances for survival and passing on our genes. 
So part of what I'm trying to do, and maybe that might be an interesting topic, is what are first principles for us as individuals and communities, getting back to some of the things that Gil and Grace were talking about. What I'm doing as part of it, my project is working on a salutogenic approach to trying to deal with various stages of life. So for example, this year I'm focusing on prenatal. How can we understand what happens to individuals biologically and also the communities they grow into in terms of creating the best outcome or the best environment for an outcome? The other piece is drug and alcohol, because people say that the other side of addiction is actually loneliness. And we're really seeing a lot of loneliness happening. So two of the projects I'm working on is applying salutogenic concepts to individuals and the communities in which they live in and thinking about how to make them as health promoting as possible. Uh, and Shimon, a lot of our problems are solvable through social hacks, not budgets, not lots of money injected, although money is needed in lots of different quarters. However, so many of the things that are broken are fixable through connection, belonging, community, uh, interdependence, mutual aid, responsibility, all those kinds of things. And those I are, agree. And those are the elements that make up the fabric of society. And there's a reason we call it the fabric of society. The interesting thing about it is, is that by getting involved, that's one of the healthiest things people can do. So when you're talking about being connected to a religious institution, there's different level of being connected. And if we're talking about Judaism already, there's different level of giving staka, giving, you know, you know, a, I don't know, contribution. And the highest level is contributing of yourself with no one knowing that or not trying to claim any credit for that. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. I mean, we're so dependent now on non-for-profit organizations, grants, you know, like government, where we forget what we as individuals can do in communities. So definitely, I agree with what you said. Thanks, Simone. Uh, Kevin, then Doug. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I put a link to an essay I wrote uh, for a Mississippi uh, uh, literary group. Um, there was, uh, back in the 1700s, uh, dirt farming Baptist and Methodist preachers approached the Anglican uh, plantation owners and said they want to preach to the slaves. And they, they went off and thought about it, and they had two conditions. One is that Exodus had to be spiritual, the whole swing low, sweet chariot, and then you couldn't mention... Uh, Jubilee. Jubilee. And, and then uh, six different um, colonies had laws against uh, that Exodus had to be spiritual. And then Robert Moses, who was the architect of the Freedom Summer in Mississippi, uh, had to do a, a rewrite of Exodus to let older Black folks know that Exodus included them so you could climb the steps of the courthouse to free yourself by voting. And it's a pretty interesting kind of thing that, that they, and Walter Brueggemann, who's a, what we would call an Old Testament scholar, uh, asked him one time, you know, why did it take the Jews, you know, for the years in the wilderness? He said, they could not imagine freedom. And uh, the same thing was true but they, with African-Americans, the, the, uh, the lack of imagination had been institutionalized by their plantation owners, or actually by the, by the folks who, who preached to them. Uh, Doug, please. And you're muted. Thanks. Um, I'm struck by the idea of going to first principles. And the first principle I want to go to is psychological, which is that the brain mind grows through relationships. Mm. And my brain mind is paying attention to every neuron in my body as I pay attention to you. Uh, every hormone, the whole thing. Now, what I notice is most of you are pretty good at keeping eye contact with the screen. I have a hard time with that because mm. if I look at you and I don't see you responding to me, it breaks the cycle and it becomes actually painful. Mm. Uh, and I think that we have a need 
a developmental need to be in a relationship with each other in concrete ways. And anything that narrows that channel, like what we're doing right now, uh, is good in some ways, but really bad in other ways. Uh, and I find it actually painful. And so I try and figure out what that's about. And it's that's that key experience that if I'm looking at you and I'm not seeing your face responding to me looking at you, at me, uh, it feels like a ma massive disconnect. I'm two tiny, two tiny hacks for that, Doug, that I'm doing right now. Uh, and I don't know that they patched the hole that you just described, but one of them is hand signals, which don't interrupt and give like, this is enthusiasm and you can do this, you can dance around, you can do whatever, you can do this, but this isn't eye contact. I get it, but but helps. And then the other one, which is defeated in Zoom gallery view when anybody raises their hand because I can no longer move the little cubes around. But the moment somebody starts speaking, I move their little rectangle up nearest the, the, the lens on my bezel so that as I'm watching them, I'm not, so right now I'm looking at John Kelly, who's in the lower left and you can tell. Right now I'm looking at Grace, who's directly under my camera and you can tell because the distance, you know, we're really good at perceiving where somebody else is looking. And that still doesn't fix the problem, but but it's a it's an effort to sort of try to not distance to to distance myself less from who from whoever is speaking or whatever is going on. Um, anyway, so, small hacks, but they don't always work. Pete, you wanted to say something? No, you're talking lo talking locally. Um, Julian, you're muted. There's a local hack for that too. You press the unmute button thing. So the uh... Yeah, one nice thing about the Zoom interface, and I'm being sarcastic, is that op the uh, hotkey for muting doesn't work if you have the chat window displayed. So um, that's interesting. So the, based, uh, I wanted this was actually for Doug. Although what you were just talking about is included, it was the devices such that you can have the something positioned. They will reflect light so that when you look at the center of the screen. It's still picking up your camera, but at least this way, it looks like you're talking, you're looking at the person who's talking. And I'm wondering if the thing that Zoom has enforced is that people are looking at the screen, whereas the camera's above the screen, so everybody's looking down. And I'm wondering how much this contributes to what you were just saying, Doug. There's also a third party camera you can buy that hangs from the top of your screen down into the middle of your screen. It's actually a little, a little, a little camera. I bought that. It's called Center Cam. Does it, does it work? It works okay. I don't have it on right now. Uh, so right now I'm, I'm looking at the camera, which looks like I'm not looking at you. And with center cam, I would be looking right here. Uh, I've, I've found it to be extremely valuable for just this problem. Mm -hmm. I also make a point, and it may be a little bit goofy, that when people are saying things that I like or respond to, I'm, I, you know, I move my head. I know we do the thing with the hands. I do the thing with my head. I just try, you know, trying to provide some sort of visual cue feedback. Doug, I feel like very much what you're talking about. And like, like you said, there's, there's good and bad to this. I mean, I can be with all of you, but it's not like being with all of you, right? Here I am, I'm now looking at, <laughs> now looking at the screen and not the camera again. So it take, it, it, I mean, it, it takes a lot of personal discipline to, you know, to train the part of the dojo thing, Jerry, of, of like training one's body to be appropriate in this medium, which is not like regular world. Right. And anyway, anytime we train ourselves to adapt like that, we lose other things. I mean, uh, you know, you have to incorporate behaviors, you have to groove something, you have to make it kind of auto auto autonomic, automatic in different ways. And then in so doing, then later when the situation has changed and we actually get to mingle with humans again and, and, and like sniff each other's pheromones, um, we will have other habits that are, that are like grooved in. And one of the things I worried about really early in the pandemic is, Will we all, will, for the rest of our lives, because we have had these two now almost, through, you know, going into three years of, of pandemic, uh, well, not quite two yet, but um, will we be hesitant to shake hands, hug, all those kinds of things in the future? Because we had a couple of years where it was just off. If you're, if you're uh, you know, if you're three years old and you're a pandemic, uh, you know, uh, youth or infant, uh, are you going, to, is that going to affect you in later life? Uh, because there was this period where, yeah, Everybody wore masks and you couldn't do much about it. Go ahead, Julian. Oh, for the record, I don't go to meetings to sniff pheromones. <laughs> you just, you order those in from Amazon? I've got a cat. Oh, that's good. That totally, totally takes care of that. 
I used to babysit and didn't realize I was allergic to cats and like I'd go home and I'd be all red and sniffly, had no idea why. <sighs> Long ago. Um, so where does that put us? Well, I like this, I like this question about what do we wanna see increase in the world in 2022? And I'd like to hear more people talk about that if people are open to that. And I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to marry that, I think, to what Paul was saying a little earlier, which is, and, and I think several people have said different versions of this, which is, why can't we see each other as co-inhabitants of this pale blue dot, as members of life together, <clears throat> whatever it is, but, but um, why, why is any sense of global unity, connectedness, belonging so hard to get to? Um, and then, maybe touching back on the religion question, why are so many religions divisive instead of inclusive in this way, right? Because religions are like, you're in my religion, not yours. Uh, in, I mean, I'm in mine, you're in yours. We don't like each other because we belong to these different groups. That, that can't be right. I mean, seriously, what went wrong with our like, God models that, that not being a member of the right club means that the other people, because of where they were born, how they were born, doesn't work. Uh, Doug, please. My great hope for 2022 is that we have a much more straightforward approach, a pragmatic approach to climate change and what's happening with that and with things like soil and ocean, and that we take it head on. Uh, so much of what we're doing is okay, but it's a distraction from that task. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, is anybody more motivated to leave Facebook, to uh, go find people and help them feel like a sense of belonging? Uh, I'm going to do the January off of Facebook. I cool. That's a good idea. That sounds, that sounds excellent. One thing that I did before I stopped using Facebook, and it was really hard. I mean, I stopped WhatsApp and I stopped Instagram. I stopped all of that. Is for a couple of weeks, I just looked at who was liking my stuff, hmm. right? Like, who was I informing really about my whereabouts and what I was doing? And how many of those people are people I really care about? And so I noticed that most of them were kind of casual friends, most people who are liking it. And I was like, it's actually okay with me that they don't know I'm in Brussels today or, you know, like whatever it is. And, and, and so that was the first thing. And then I noticed that the people I cared about, my family, the people who, they also were among the people who paid attention to my posts. Those are the people I wanted to inform. And then, um, you know, so, I was like, well, I can do that on our family chat. But then it was really obvious that um, on your small family group chat, which in, it's all our cousins and whatever, maybe there are 15 or 20 of us on there. Like you don't post a picture of yourself having a great dinner or you know showing off your vacation. Like that's obnoxious in this situation, right? Like it's actually a, an obnoxious thing to show all your friends a picture of you in a bikini and you know whatever it is you're showing off right like not me in a bikini but you know you get the idea like and I was like well that's so interesting isn't it because immediately I had no socially acceptable way of kind of telling my family hey here I am in Brussels right um mm -hmm. and and I was like, wow, how did it become so acceptable to just boast about all the good things in your life all the time to everybody? Like, how did that be? Like, because it immediately wasn't okay anymore. If you want to talk about your last vacation, you call up, you're like, hey, how are you doing? You know, and, 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 you ever, and then it's okay. It's not boasting, but they kind of have to hear your tone of voice to know that you're not boasting about it, but just having a friendly conversation. So yeah, that was a really interesting discovery for me. Mm -hmm. um, last holiday season, not this Christmas, not this holiday season, but last Christmas, last year we got a, a, a Christmas card from a family that they're, they're acquaintances, they're not very close to us, but the card was completely tone deaf to, hey, we're actually in the middle of a pandemic. 
and, and the card was basically sort of boastful and showing off kind of stuff that had happened in their lives and, and, and made zero mention that, that, that anything was going on in the world. And, and uh, I think April wrote her friend and said, hey, dude, that, that's a little off. It was just, it, it just like rubbed us in both immediately entirely the wrong way. Um, Doug. A version of needing to be happy is smiling for the photograph, which I consider a real mm. mythology. Actually, if you look at pictures up until in the early 1900s uh, of groups, people are not smiling. That's actually and I because think you, you took long exposures to actually capture. No, it's, that's an ex, that's one explanation, but I don't think it's the whole one. Really? Okay. Uh, because when cameras got faster, uh, it took a while for the got a smile for the camera to catch it's on. Small thing. Okay. And what's striking to me is that if you look at a face that's not smiling, you can read it better than you can read a face that's smiling. Mm -hmm. Smiling mm -hmm. actually breaks the connection between the face and the underlying emotional state. Uh, and so I think, but the need to, got to show you're smiling, smile for the camera, all that stuff that we live with all the time is really pretty toxic, actually. Um, so RBF is a good thing? That? What's RBF? Resting bitch face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, much better, much better. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is everybody familiar with the difference between emotional work and emotional labor? No, please. Um, so, and I'm I'm trying to pull this out of my out of my memory. I'll, I'll I can post it from my brain. But emotional labor is jobs that require you to smile. So you're the greeter. You have a you have some position mm. of contact with the public, and you need to smile. Uh, flight attendants are like like emotional labor. Hey, welcome to the flight. So nice having you on here, even though you were an asshole in the aisle. Um, emotional emotional work is paying attention to what has to be done in the meeting for emotions. And a lot, of, a lot of emotional work lands on women because women understand those dynamics better because men are often just oblivious to them uh, because roles and, and stereotypes and all that kind of stuff. But emotional work is noticing that so-and-so is sitting in the corner looking kind of sad and quiet and has, hasn't done anything and stepping over and saying, you okay, that's emotional work. And it's not a part of the job description, right? Emotional labor, is, is labor that requires you to be happy and maybe other, other forms of emotions. So Jerry, um, what, do you, what do you call it when, when I go up to someone and says, are you okay just because I want to do that and I care about that? What do you that's that? kind of emotional work. And I hate that the word work is attached to that. Makes sense. Um, but, but it's emotional care might be a much better phrasing for it, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, emotional work in a work setting is still sort of interesting as work, uh, so, so the, the, the care for the emotions is really the important umbrella, but the fact that it's emotional work means that the group will benefit enormously from having those things actually taken care of, that that's, a, that's an important part of a high functioning group uh, is that work. Um, so Pete, did I get the, the difference correctly? Cool. Yeah, Pete um, has actually had an implant. He's not turning his head because <laughs> there's a like a, a light fiber jack in the middle of, of the back of his skull, and he is directly wired into the network now. Uh, he is the, he is the alpha prototype of the neural lace project. He needs uh, to log a cable. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and therefore there is no gap now between an utterance uh, and very soon in a couple of OGM calls, I'm expecting that Pete will pre. Uh, post to the chat what the person was about to say. I think that's coming. Isn't Peter that Precog. The, isn't that on the feature list, Pete? Yep, yep. Hey, Scott, so welcome to the call. Nice to see you. We talked hey, about you most. We talked about you most of the call. Oh yeah, I'm sure you did. Huh. Yeah, I just thought I'd pop in and say hello at the end of this 2021, and uh, I know it's only the last few minutes of your call, but. Um, I don't know. Been thinking about you guys and hoping all are well. Thank you. Um, Ask the question. Uh, yeah. You mean the initial, the original question? Sure. So let me actually go back and find it here. Um, so we kind of started the conversation with what are the qualities we would like to increase in the world and why, which Paul Crafell put in, in, in the conversation. And Scott, if that triggers anything for you, please feel free to riff. And then we went lots of different, lots of different interesting places from there.
I'm actually modeling the behavior and I didn't realize it. Answering slowly. Mm. Mm. There's a practice of taking a breath before stepping into conversation. I'm forgetting where that comes from, but uh, it's good. Yeah, um, I'm noticing that we've, we're losing our ability to finish sentences or finish thoughts because, I, you know, we always have that interest in jumping in. I'm, I'm terrible at that. I want to jump in because I get excited, but I notice that it's better when I let someone fully finish their thought, especially when I disagree with them. Mm -hmm. um, because I usually am slightly wrong, at least, in what I thought they were going to say next or how they were going to finish that thought. Mm -hmm. And also, as we discussed many times before, talking is thinking. And I'm letting them think. And I've often found that they contradict themselves and realize it and get to a better place just by allowing them to finish their thought. And if I jump in with the first thing that they say, that might not even be their actual thought. And they just haven't sorted it out yet. But I, if I can give them that space and be okay with hearing things that I might not want to hear, and maybe they didn't even want to say yet, but giving them that ability to say those things, that's, that's something I've noticed. My life is better. The people around me are better when that happens. And so that is a quality I would like to see more of. Hmm. Totally was not about to interrupt you saying that, that's for sure. Um, and, and I'm, I, I love what you said, Scott. Thank you for that. Uh, reminds me of two stories, which some of you might've heard. One of them, they both come out of Quakerism, <clears throat> which I was a fan of and still am a fan of. Quaker. I was introduced to Quakerism when I lived in Connecticut and a friend of mine saw that I was glum after a breakup. And he said, hey, the family and I have been going to a Wilton monthly meeting. Would you like to join us? And I'm like, what? And the moment, the, the, like the greeter at the door is a rotating voluntary position. The moment the greeter, John Lee, shook my hand, I felt entirely welcome and included. And he handed me a little, a little pamphlet that says, here's what silent meeting is about. And I sat down in, 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 you know, in the meeting house and read it and I was like, wow, and, and I stuck. Um, so two things. One is that Quakers have a nice saying, which is you should only break the silence to improve on it. And one of the things that makes friends meeting actually work is that you don't reply to somebody else's message during silent worship. You actually sort of wait and listen. And, and, and there's, a, there's a tremendous interesting role that silence plays in, in Quaker meeting, which is beautiful. And it's hard to have a bunch of excited people with a lot to say in a room and maintain that kind of rhythm because it would take months and months to have you know, the conversation we just had in the last hour and a half. But I, but I love that. And then second thing is, at one point in my life in Connecticut, I attended a, an evening session where somebody was teaching a Quaker process with an attention for business or something like that. And he asked us a question and all of us were like, and he said, why don't we just hold that question for three minutes and just like go into silence. And I, I was like, how the hell did I get to be 35 years old? And that's the first time anybody's ever offered me that. Like, like how, how have I gone through life where this you know, oh, 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 Arnold Horshack is my instinctive response. Like I go, I go right into action. Like I'm pretty quick. I can, I can answer that. And, and the three minutes made all of our answers more considered. It was fabulous. And I was just sad. I mean, I was happy to have discovered that, but sad that I'd made it that old without, uh, without having had that happen for me. Uh, go ahead, Scott. But you're so, so, so you've, you, one thing you said, I never realized why it worked. <clears throat> so you said something about having the conversation. Um, it, my, my thought that came to mind, I can't remember exactly what you said, was that when I'm able to do this, I can have the conversation once. And by that, I mean, we can actually, whatever the, the thing is, we can, we can get it. And if I don't do that, if I answer, if I jump in, if I want to do that, what I end up doing is having the conversation over and over. 
because we didn't really get to the point where we had we had the conversation where both people were able to actually, or one person even was able to express the full thought and we would get to the real thing. So that, that's interesting to me. I'm gonna have to think about that is that, what, oh, I know what it was. You said you wanna jump in and we wanna, we don't wanna have that space and time because it's gonna take forever. I was like, well, it might take longer right now, but in the long haul, maybe it takes less time because now we actually, hurt each other. So that's what it brought to mind. Mm -hmm. One of the other phenomena of Quaker meeting is that if you go quiet, sometimes you hear the thing you knew you had to say come out of somebody else's mouth and often better. Like like just, you know, not leaping in and letting letting things come from other people really works. Gil, did you want to jump in? Um, uh, well, I, I guess I did. <laughs> I didn't. Know. Awesome. I love how that works. Yeah, um, just to what, what Doug said before, this, you know, Doug has been, um, you may have noticed using the word body-mind to remind us that this is not a brain process we're talking about, it's a whole body process, but mind is also something that lives here among us all, and that's very demonstrated in what you just described in Quaker meeting, where the thoughts are not mine, the thoughts are ours. They arise together. Fernando once, uh, I remember, challenged somebody who was talking about, I think this and that, he said, well, you're not thinking person you know, bristled, how, how dare you say that? You said, no, thinking is something that's happening to you. And uh, I, I found that a very rich thought in observing what we do here and what happens in Quaker meeting and the rest. It's something that arises in us uh, from Lord knows what. Anyway. Thanks, Gil. And there's a couple of words we use, we throw around like collective intelligence, collaborative sense-making, uh, thinking together, hive mind. There's a whole bunch of sort of phrases that, that fall around here. I don't know, everybody prob probably has their preferences there. Uh, Paul, please jump in. You are still muted. There we go. Nope, you've lowered your hand. Oh, was raising your hand accidental? I assume you're talking to me. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to share something in terms of Scott. I remember a story my brother told me he became a deacon on his church. And um, he noticed after several years that he and the younger deacons were always right in there talking and, and they're trying to make a discussion. And he noticed that the older deacons just were quiet. And then after all the younger deacons had talked a lot, the older deacons would say something and that would just resolve everything. And so that kind of reminds me of just what Scott and so, and so my brother started going, I think I'll talk less and listen more. And I think that's the process of moving from a younger deacon to an older deacon. Love that. Along those lines, I understand that um, in some uh, First Nations communities, when they, they hold a council, they always allow the, they have the young people go first, you know, and they progress up the generations and then the elders speak last. And um, that way everybody gets to talk. And um, there's actually this ties to a, a very well-known cognitive bias of if you're in a meeting and you let the senior people talk first, that junior people will never speak against them. They'll never introduce new ideas. So this idea of let's start with the kids and let work all the way up. And then the elders have the, the last word, I think has got a lot of wisdom to it. Love that. We've, uh, we've run through our 90 minutes. If anybody has any words you might want to offer to close this call, that would be great. If not, I will take us out. I'll offer some more. Please, Grace. Because you alluded to the, uh, one of you um, alluded to this idea that when we pause and listen, we have the conversation once instead of many that was times. Scott. Scott. And the nature of communication is that after you've said it, it disappears if you've been listened to. And I feel that these conversations are like that. Like people have listened to me and I have listened to them and something gets created and something disappears. Okay, I, that was perfect. <laughs> Just gotta say, thank you for that. And um, this is our last call for 2021. I am extremely grateful for you. Uh, in pandemic times, there's sort of nothing like a habit, a Zoom habit, uh, where you see people and get to know each other and uh, try to do something together. Uh, so I just uh, want to offer my thanks. And, um, and I think it's my thanks. So 
see you on the inner tubes and uh, next week. Many thanks, everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. Stay safe, be healthy. Exactly. Many thanks, everyone. <clears throat>